I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer, and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Schneer, and I am so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with us. Today, we welcome Peter Bass to the podcast, an amazing client of mine who has really made magic happen in just a few days. Peter is completing a doctorate of musical arts at the University of Toronto and has been working on his applications for university professor positions. Peter, I'm so glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Can you start by telling us a bit about yourself and what you're doing now? Sure. Like you said, I'm doing my doctorate in musical arts, which is a bit of an odd degree in that it's half theoretical, half practical. So there's still a lot of performing opportunities balanced with theoretical and research. So I've been working in the classical music field for, uh, well, since my undergrad, which was about 14 years ago. So I've been doing it for a long time. Going into it, I had no idea what this world was like, but I went into it sort of blind, but really opened my eyes very quickly. And so here I am now doing, getting my doctorate, which is the weirdest thing in the world, especially for like a guy that went to theater school when he was 20. And now he's just wanted to perform when he was a kid, but now you're something entirely different. So, so that's what I'm doing now. I also have a private voice studio that I share with my wife, PB and J Music Studio. And uh, we teach singing of all genres and pretty much all ages, except for the very young. So we're balancing that. We also have two children. So, you know, our life is pretty full. Yes. And and just a little plug, I am a student at that studio. Yes, you are. I love it. I love it. I have been I've been studying classical opera technique with Jess for quite some time. And so oh. if anybody's looking for a voice studio, this is a good one. We are the ones to go to. <laughs> yes. Yes. I've been doing that since I was 14, actually, maybe even younger. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I met Jess a little bit after that. But yeah, I love it. Just love it. And it is like the best form of therapy. It truly is. Like there are so many reasons why it's great for therapy. It, yeah, it sings amazing. It's all about, you know, well, I don't know what direction we want to go with that one. We can, we can. So many. I know. We'll get there. We'll get, we'll yeah. get there. We'll get there. That's yeah. amazing. Can you actually tell us a bit about where you've performed? Because you're, you're, you have quite a portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to be able to perform A lot. I've performed all over Canada. I've performed in the U.S. I've sung in Germany and Italy. Done some really exciting stuff. I went and worked at the Miami Wagner Institute down in Miami. Yeah, had some really fulfilling, fulfilling times there. And yes, and you're a baritone. Yes. Yes, Yes, I am a baritone. And and a wonderful baritone at that. Let me just (laughs) let me just say. Let me just say, so now you're, you're doing your doctorate, which is something that you never thought you'd be doing. And when I was doing my doctorate, I, I also never thought that I would be doing it. When in episode two of this podcast, where I talk a bit about my journey here, part of what I talk about is that before I applied to a PhD, before I was even in my master's, I didn't even know what a PhD was. (laughs) So I think that it's so important just to talk about the fact that you do things that you don't even know are are in your future. Yeah, totally. It's a really, really strange experience. The imposter syndrome is real. Not so much anymore. I've sort of grown into myself. But every step of the way that you go through it, it feels like, can I actually do this? Like, is this actually something that just like, I'm a normal person. I've known myself my entire life. And yeah, for never dreaming of getting a doctorate, it's it's pretty surreal but uh, really exciting yeah and one of so one of my philosophies is that imposter syndrome is actually discomfort in periods of growth 
Yeah. How do you feel about that? I, I love it. I, I agree with you. Yeah. I've done some reading in imposter syndrome as well. And the author was sort of saying that people that feel imposter syndrome are actually the best students because <laughs> they've sort of looked over the other side of the fence and seen the vastness of, you know, the potential of knowledge and of research and things. And so they can feel rather small about it. Whereas the people that are just in there gung ho, ready to, you know, <laughs> take over the world, they haven't actually looked over the fence and they might be in for it, you know, down the road. For sure. And these periods of growth are the most important periods because yeah. our, our discomfort in these periods actually guides us, actually right. guides us in, in developing the skills that we need and developing the mindset that we need and in developing the, also the network. Yeah. Of, of peers and colleagues that will help us to grow. Yeah. Right. That's right. So I think that that's, then that it's just so important that we, that we don't shy away from those feelings of discomfort, that we actually embrace them and we let them guide us. I think that that's, I think that that's one of the most important takeaways that I, that I have when it comes to imposter syndrome. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your research because I just, love your research question <laughs> and what you're looking at. So could you tell us a bit about that? Right. Well, it's actually a great segue from talking about discomfort. What I'm really looking at is I'm looking at the somatic meaning of the body and emotional relationships. So finding out how emotions are manifested in the body as they're happening in real time. And by looking at these reactions, we can find better control of our bodies. And I and I use the word control in the most positive of senses. There isn't, it's more of a freeing of the body through acknowledging, like you said, acknowledging the discomfort and doing the work with those sensations in your body instead of trying to shy away from them. And so I've been looking a lot at that. This might be jumping ahead, but in our work together, you tied it in with identity, which is totally true because emotions are our identity. It's it's how our body is reacting to the world that creates our identity. There's a lot of really interesting ideas and stuff that are being bandied about in my field or in my in my own personal research. It's really, really exciting. Yes. And just for some context on that point, when we were working together, we were discussing your research question specifically as it pertained to performers and, and how their emotions were reflective of or help to form their identities as a performer versus as a personal individual performing. Yes. So yes, there was exactly. a very clear distinction between performer versus personal and what emotions are you feeling as an individual that right. you either have to figure out how to manage as you're performing or that you use to your advantage as a performer. Yes. And that is a really important transitional point in in that identity conversation when it comes to studying emotion. Yeah, exactly. And as an opera singer, you're singing characters. Yes. Characters are going through these very heightened dramatic experiences. And from a physical level, a singer can feel these things like the character is. There's the famous aria from Pagliacci where it says, laugh, clown, laugh, and he's weeping. And, you know, you, you hear these in all these old recordings of the, the tenor going, oh, poo, 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 poo. <laughs> and it's it sort of, it's, it's an affect and it's, it's, it's effective to, a, to a certain extent. But if he were to actually start crying on the stage there are a lot of things technically with this voice that will just get thrown out the window your larynx is going to go right up into your uh, mouth your facial muscles are going to start tensing up and this is really going to detract from the actual art form which is sound based mm -hmm. it's not it's not the visual performance that you see in movies and things like that right and so let's, so, so I think that this is such a great place to talk about your journey. Sure. How did you, how did you get here to this place? Did you ever expect to be in this place that you're at right now, personally, professionally? And did you ever think 
that you'd be writing applications for professorial positions. I found it hard to believe that I was applying for professorial positions when I was literally pressing submit for the application. Like <laughs> right. I still find that it's a bit of a, there's a disjunct in my understanding about that. But a lot of my life, you know, if I talk to my 16 year old self to say that, A, I'm a classical singer would just be absurd. That I have, you know, I'm working on my third degree. That's like bizarre because I was not a good student in high school, but, but now I'm a very good student. And I... so all of these things are just unfathomable. So what got me here was I've always loved performing. And so I went to theater school when I was 20 years old and that was musical theater. So it was really, really practical, you know, just 12 hours a day, five days a week of song and dance. And so I went and did that. And by the end of the two years, did not like these songs and dance. <laughs> and so, but of course, as a young, stubborn person, I would not readily admit that. So I went out into the field. I worked in the field for five years before I decided that I didn't like it. And I thought, I'll go back, get my degree, learn how to sing, sing, like really learn how to sing, learn music. And I did that. I did my undergrad. I did that at U of T as well. And then I took two or three years off after my undergrad because I realized that I didn't actually learn how to sing in a, in a way that really was sustainable. So what I learned in my undergrad, which is really no fault of any one individual, but what I learned from my, in retrospect for my undergrad was how to fix mistakes as opposed to how to take control of my body and become an expressionful person. So when I started really, I got a new teacher and I started learning to work somatically learning to figure out what the mechanics are of singing and how to really use my body to its full potential and create beautiful, beautiful sound, beautiful music and beautiful artistry. And so that's what I was doing during that time. While I was sort of in this process of developing my voice, I figured I might as well go get my master's because I'm not feeling like I'm marketable quite yet. So I might as well go into my master's again. The doctorate idea is just not even, it's not even a blip on the radar at all. And so I went and did my master's and took those tears to years to really develop my voice, get things in line technically and artistically. And yeah, and I think I did that and it, it really worked out for me. And then when I finished my master's, took a couple of years off again and Got a few gigs here, got a few gigs there, doing pretty well for myself. But I wasn't quite getting to the level that I wanted to. I The level of the, the gigs just, it wasn't paying the bills first off. It wasn't sustainable. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to do one more big audition push. I'm going to just go out and do the work, sing for people, get jobs. But then, of course, COVID hit mm -hmm. and all that got put to the side. And so my plan was if this audition tour didn't work, I was going to go for my doctorate. And uh, I already had my research idea sort of, you know, festering in me. I, I'm not sure if I should use the word fester, but that's what I chose. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is like a disease. These, uh... We're very real here. We're very <laughs> real. <laughs> yeah. And so... So anyway, so then I then I decided to do my doctorate, really got on it and did the application and got in. And and here we are now, one year later. Yeah. So how did you feel during your application processes for grad school? Well, so for my master's, I really didn't think too much about my future as an academic. My master's program was it it's more or less a practical degree as well. So a lot of performing and not a lot of research. And so when I went and did that, there wasn't a big writing component because that's not what the nature of the degree was. And so that was pretty easy. The big shift was going into a DMA where, you know, you're, that's the number one reason of getting your doctorate is because you have a research idea and it, it's got to be, you know, something that has legs, as they say. Mm -hmm. And so 
So the application for the doctorate was, first off, there were so many more components to a doctorate application than a master's. So the idea of having to use a sample writing, which didn't have to pertain to my research, but mine did. And it was uh, sort of the blind leading the blind, me being blind and (laughs) Google being blind. So, you know, I'd go on not having the academic resources of all these accounts that you get as a student. It it made for the the research to pre be a bit of a slog. Yeah. But, and so that was a, a big component that it took me a long time to write this laughably short paper in retrospect, but to get all of these ideas sort of set together. So that was a really big hurdle for me because I'd never really done any research before. And now I was expected to do a real academic paper based on research that's really important to me. So I mm-hmm. wanted to make sure that I was doing it justice for myself, but also doing it justice for people I've never met. Yeah. And one thing that a lot of applicants actually don't know is that your writing sample can be something you've previously written. Mm-hmm. It can be something that you've submitted for coursework in the past. It it can yes. be something you've submitted for your master's. It can be something you even submitted in your undergrad if you're applying to a master's. And so what happens a lot when applicants come to me for their applications for grad school is say, oh, my gosh, I have to write a writing sample. No, no, no. Let's look back at what you've done already. That's the writing sample. And so there there are so many components to applications that applicants just don't know about, don't know what's required. And of course, it's no fault of the applicant. I was there, too. It's mm-hmm. that there are really no resources out there for actual application support, actual yeah. applications guidance. What does each component of the application actually mean and what is the committee looking for? And so this is one of the most important things that informs my work as an advancement coach and strategist, because not only have I been an applicant to all of these programs, but I've also been on the other side of the table on admissions committees and on job search and promotion committees at the university and in the private sector. So yeah. that has been such a helpful and informative and foundational experience for me, because then when my clients come to me, when you come to me and you say, listen, I've got this application, what what do I do? I have all the answers. <laughs> yeah, you really do have all of the answers. Like, So tell me uh, about that. <laughs> tell me about your experience working together. I had a blast, oh, by the way. Yeah, I did too. It was <laughs> really, really good. There was one moment early on in this three hour session. That's the only to, that's what we had. Yeah, we had. So our, our, our session was we were on like real crunch time. Yeah, <laughs> we were on real crunch time. So we, we packed everything in to what we call a half day strategy session. Right. We packed everything in. And by the end of our working together, you were able to submit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there was early on, you said, okay, I'm going to show you something. And I don't want you to clutch your pearls quite yeah. yet. And then for the next three hours, I was just clutching my pearls the entire time. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, exactly. uh, the, the thing is that what, what I was doing was again, me just trying my best without any real resources. It's just like that research application that I was doing for my DMA. Only this time it was for professional work, but I was like, I don't know how to structure even like basic stuff. Like, I'm sure maybe I know Times New Roman, but yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's about it. But how am I going to structure the information so it's easily accessible and uh, streamlined and unified within all the components of the application. And so really what it was is I was losing the unity of everything by trying to do these components individually. We worked on my teaching statement and the teaching statement corresponded with my research statement. And these two things, when they came together, really got my idea of a cover letter and even my resume and got the right words and ideas that, yeah, unify the whole experience and the whole application and also unify all the information in my head as well. So I was able to really write it down instead of sort of guessing about what I should be talking about. Right. And so when you when we started working together, I remember that we I had your materials, I had your resume in front of me, I had your cover letter, I had everything. And I said, you know, Peter, I know you've done more than this. Yeah. I know you've done more than this. Let's find it and write it down. And part of figuring out the application and figuring out 
the value that you bring and the significance of your experience is in really taking the time to reflect on your experience and and how significant it really was and is for right. you. And that is one thing that that we really focused on is what have you done? Okay, but what's the significance of it? Mm-hmm. And so bit by bit, as we work together quickly, and, and our sessions were really intense. <laughs> they were an intense little chunk of time, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> and I, I really like how you describe it, that everything came together. And the way that I, I describe it is that every application is made up of different puzzle pieces and everything has to fit together. Yeah. Everything has to fit together. And the the imagery or whatever is on the puzzle has to coalesce. Everything has to fit. And so a piece may sort of awkwardly fit here, but it works better over here. Right. And so this is part of the strategy that we worked with. Where do things where do things belong and where do things fit and how can we really unpack your experience and you, and the significance of your experience and the value that you bring to the institution that you're applying to, right? It's not just about what they can offer you. Yeah. You bring them value. Right. And that's something that I think really turned your all of your writing on its head and set you on a new trajectory in terms of what you were writing and how you were writing it. To understand that you were telling them and communicating to the committee that here's the value that I bring. Here's all of my experience and here's why I belong here. That's right. Yeah, it's it's a weird, there's a disjunct in my self-worth within myself and then the idea of that my worth for somebody else. It's a Mm. really interesting idea. But you're right, I it it came up like, Oh, I don't have any, I've never been a professor before. So how can my experience be valid except that I've been teaching and living my life and performing for a long time? And so the experience, it's not like the experience isn't there. Right. I just had to reframe the experience into something that, yeah, like you said, really is to their benefit. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I remember one of the conversations that we had was you said to me, I've never like I've never been a professor. I said, hello, all you do is teach. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. That's what you do. You have a music school. That's what you do. Yeah, that's right. I have a skill set and it's very, very honed and established. Yeah. yeah. And we work yeah. through your teaching philosophy. We work through what it means to teach to you because it's more than just relaying information. It's so much more than that, especially when you're working with musicians and the body. It is yeah. so much more than that for a singer to teach. And for sure. And so you have to and and we did unpack what teaching meant for you and what it means for you and how you will apply it to teaching at that institution. And that yeah. was also a really big breakthrough, I think, that you had. Yeah, I think that was the unifying little nugget that I was able to expand into all aspects of the application. Was that that teaching philosophy and why we're, you know, not we, but why students and I come together and why we take the time to do this kind of work. Yeah. And so as we were unpacking all of this really big stuff, like this was big stuff. This wasn't this wasn't a small application by any stretch. This was a big application that we really knocked out of the park. So how did you feel in those intensive sessions that we had? taking away the the conversation that we had implementing the the system structure strategies that I gave you and that we worked together on how did you feel taking that away implementing all of that and then coming back to do some more work how did you feel in that process i felt really empowered and i love the word empowered because i talk about empowering of students and of myself all the time and what happened was you give me a structure and it empowers me. So a lot of people think that structure is sort of hindering you, but it really giving you a structure gives you so much room for flexibility within a structure to put down ideas and get them sort of formulated in the way that you want it to. There was an author that talked about the alphabet being 26 letters and how if we had 48 letters, we wouldn't have the kind of creative potential of writing down your words. Mm. It's the, the language is precise and, and very limited to 26 letters. 
even binary code, binary code is two, zero and one, but it can create like worlds and all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that was a bit of a tangent. (laughs) <laughs> but I think, but I think really, really interesting symbolism Yeah, for structure, because it's not that I provide like this rigid structure that, that everybody has to use. It's that because I know what committees are looking for, because I was on them, I know from reading hundreds of not only graduate school applications, master's PhD, but also professorial stream, full-time promotion applications and applications for jobs in the private sector that I know what committees need. And so it's not that I give everyone the same structure, but it's that we strategize based on your experience and what the committees need to hear, see, and read from you. And so for, for your application, there was a, there was a very unique component, which is unique to your field, which is that you also had to submit a media sample, a recording. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so that was also an amazing part of your application because it, it allowed you to jump off the page even further. That's right. You get not only a visual representation of, say, Googling myself and seeing a, a picture on the Internet, but you get to see me in action. And that is a true, it's it's a true it, uh, form of expression is singing. And so I got to sing and show you my artistry or show the committee my artistry. So you're right. It's a really personal level, that component. And for that reason, because the voice and music is such a personal thing, we were able to also work some of that into your philosophy. Yeah. your Just your experience as a student and your experience as a teacher, working in a field that is so personal, really. Like the the professional is very personal when it comes to music. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it is, it isn't really music unless you're putting yourself out there Mm -hmm. and being entirely vulnerable. It's a very exposing experience to, to sing in front of people. And it shows who you are as a person. If, if you're going to crumble, that's okay. You're allowed to crumble and, and make mistakes, but it's how you react to say the somatic reaction of your throat tightening up. Can you therefore not react against it, but embrace it and create space within that to create beautiful artistry. And so we were able to take all of this really deep experience that you have and communicate it because I I had that structure to guide us. Right, exactly. And it comes down to choice. What you do by giving me the structure is it reduces the choices to what I want to include in the application. Mm. You you give me the structure, so I say, okay, I know what to do with the format. I don't have to think about that at all. I just fill in the blanks, and then I can really get to the content. Mm -hmm. And by filling in the blanks, just for some context, what you're referring to is that for every single paragraph, there is something specific that we need to hit on. That's right. And in each of those paragraphs, that's where once you have that, the the idea of what exactly needs to be included, that's where your experience can really come alive. Yeah, exactly. Because you know where to put it. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Should it go here? Should it go here? Should it go in the teaching statement or the research statement or my cover letter? Or or maybe in some way we talk about different aspects throughout what's in the resume. So perhaps you can tell me a bit about your experience with resume development with me using that template. Sure. So what you gave me was a professional template. This is how a professional puts out their information. Right. Very different than a word template. Uh, yeah. We, <laughs> I, I don't want to say that I use the word template for my resume. Everybody and does <laughs> before they come to me. All I get is word templates coming to me. And then I yeah. think, no, 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 this isn't going to cut it. And in retrospect, I'm thinking, why is it so colorful? Why do you, have, why are there so many different fonts going on all at once? Yeah. But anyway, so, so I think it boils down again to choice. It's like, okay, I, this is a professional template. Now that choice is out of the way. I'm going to be professional. And so every single thing that I included in this professional template was professional mm-hmm. as long as my ideas and well, even in a resume, these short, being concise, but 
effectively explanatory of what your experience is. And so I was able to find that the conciseness of the ideas was also inherent in that professional structure. So it really became writing. It was very easy. You know, you, you fill in where, when, and just the exact description became all of a sudden authentically myself and on the professional level. And I'll just give some background. I developed this professional formatting for resume over the course of my own resumes and developing my own resumes and CVs and helping clients. And, it, you know, I've actually copyrighted the, my templates that I, that I use with my clients because one of the things that is so important is the way your application looks. Just what does it look like? Forget about the content for a second. What does it look like? Does it look clean? Does it look professional? Do, are your fonts and the whether something is italicized or bolded, is it consistent throughout? Are you using three letter short forms for the months or four? Mm -hmm. You know, everything. And, and we, we really get that detail oriented in this because it matters. And so what does somebody's resume look like? What do somebody's materials look like more generally as compared to others? And one of the big things that I learned while I was on admissions committees is that there is such a breadth of how applications look. And it's so clear. It's so clear who understands professionalism and who doesn't. It's so clear. And so this is why automatically, whenever I'm working with a client, I say, here, take this, take this, take the resume, take this, take this, because this is what you need. You need this because it looks clean, polished, professional. Right. And what you want is for the committee or whoever's reading it to not focus on the formatting. You don't want them to have any comments about the font. You don't want them to have any comments about anything except, wow, this is a candidate I want. And so the formatting is so clean and professional. There's no bells and whistles, but it is so easy. Everything is lined up. Everything is immaculate. That's right. Detail oriented. Because, yeah. You want the information to be put across instantly. Yes. And that's that's exactly what it is. So, yeah, the lines are clean. So you don't have to your eye isn't veering off into a corner because, you know, you're you didn't press space, the space bar six times. Right. You only pressed it five times. Right. <laughs> right. And you don't have to worry about the spacing with my template. It's done. It's done. You never have to worry about spacing again. It's never going to get screwed up. Right. It's easy. So really happy that that was useful to you. So. During our live sessions, how did you actually feel? Because I know it was a lot. Yeah. And it was really there. We covered a ton. We we covered a ton. It was overwhelming. It was, was it overwhelming? <laughs> at the beginning, at the beginning, I, I warned you. <laughs> and I yeah. said, this is, this is going to be very intensive because this application is extremely involved. Yeah. And you need the tools that I'm going to give you in order to be able to underwhelm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so there was... So much information being thrown at me. One of the most beneficial things was just knowing that there was going to be a recording. Yes. So knowing that, you know, if I don't need to grasp everything right now, all I need to do is work on what we're working on right now. And I can go back and references. I would, I would just for my cover letter, I found the cover letter part, pressed the space bar and just formatted from there. And yes. so I, that that was actually a big relief for me was to know that I didn't have to make notes really, except for maybe a couple of to do's here and there. But no, you were learning during our sessions. Exactly. You weren't you weren't trying to take notes because, yes, I, I provide all of my clients with recordings of their sessions so that they can go and really implement everything that we're talking about, especially yeah. when we're working on such a substantive application in such a short period of time. I said to you, this is going to be recorded. We're going to go fast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because and we need to we pack it all very in. fast. Yeah. We did, but you got it. You got it yeah. all. And I, and, and we did have like, we did have sort of like some slower moments where I, where we had check-ins and like, do you get this? Do you have questions? And, and we yeah. had discussions throughout, but, but it's, it's, yeah, the, the recording is extremely helpful so that yeah. you can go and work on it on your own time. Yeah. And I sort of feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but again, that's, that's taking away a choice. So me thinking, do I have to remember this mm -hmm. information right now or can I just let it go and get the basic understanding 
right now and leave the really the fine tuning for a later time. And that's exactly what happens. The choice was taken away so I could just really learn and experience the the session instead of, you know, worrying about remembering stuff. Yes. So now having gone through all of this work that we that we did together, do you feel as though you could complete another application based on the work that we did, based on the skills that you developed? Yes, I can. It's I would say for Almost any application now, I've done 80% of the work. Yes. And so now all I have to do is fine tune it. Every application I do is going to be fine tuning it and enhancing, cutting, adding, but it's all going to be based within this basic framework of the application that I've created. Right. And you can, and you know, we talked about this when we first started, everything that you've created, you will use indefinitely into the future. Yes. For yes, any exactly. job. And and the resume, the cover letter, all the formatting that we did applies across the board because professional formatting is timeless. <laughs> it's it's like my my resume was uh, when I was 18 years old, looked like a resume made by an 18 year old. Yeah. Let's be honest, my word template that I used two weeks ago was also like an 18 year old's resume. Yeah, I wasn't going to call you out on that. You get <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's fine. I, I'm allowed not to know stuff. It's yes, like, absolutely. It's, and that's, that's so true. You know, something that I always say is application development is not intuitive at all. It's yep. absolutely a learned skill. We were not born knowing how to write an application, knowing yeah. how to write a resume, knowing how to connect material between different components of the application and really understanding how to how to showcase the significance of what it is that we've done. That's a skill. Yeah. That's a skill. And that's a skill that I work on with all of my clients and and that you really grasped. Yeah. Well, I I teach it to my students all the time. Yes. I have a student who's singing in German for the first time ever. There's no reason why I would expect for his German to be remotely good. But I just asked him, just go for it and try your best and we'll all have a good laugh and then we'll move forward. Right. Which is pretty much what we did with my word template. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I do grasp that. And it's an important lesson for really any skill that you have to do. Is that yes. It's something you have to learn. Yes, that frames it perfectly. Right. Okay, so... How has the way that you see yourself changed from before working with me to after? I think the key is empowerment through structure. So I find that I feel very empowered when I can sit down and look at the structure and put myself into the structure. I find that I didn't really know that about myself. Mm. I was like, I knew that I needed structure, but I didn't understand how how effective structure could work for me. I'm learning a new note taking system, which is really building a structure to not how I read books, but how I can make the information that I'm bringing into my mind in a very personal way. So, you know, you, I write down one idea at a time and keep those ideas in an application on my computer and you put sort of tags and so you can find them later and you can connect notes to one another. And what this does is it, it sort of takes a lot of the processing out of my, it's not my processing isn't my responsibility. My responsibility is the information and the connections. So I can see three notes, see how they correlate, and I can make an idea from those three notes and really create something. So this is what structure does for me. It frees me up for the, with the, frees up the processing space yes. to really create me as a person and putting myself on the paper instead of me paraphrasing a quote sort of poorly. Right. Instead, I can summarize an idea and put it on the paper. Right. And. And the structure also allows you to implement the strategy in a very pointed way. That's right. The The structure is the strategy. It's a huge part of the strategy. Yeah. 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 It's really, it's again, it's honing the process to a very structured way so that to deviate would be 
just complicating the issue. Yes, yes, yes. And so much of the work that we did, you were like, oh, that just goes there. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And then we, and then we bring that, and then we bring life to it after that. So we worked on the structure, but we also worked on really bringing the spirit of everything that you do into your materials to make them yours. Yeah, exactly. I truly feel that this application was a true representation of myself, even though it, like you said, it was professional, Mm -hmm. but I'm also a professional person, but it's finding, you know, me as the professional instead of the professional and me sort of squeezing into what society or whatever thinks professional means. But we're all just people being professional. That's right. And how you choose to be that professional comes through that expression. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So through our work together, what did you learn about applications? I think having the guidance to really take out all the guesswork into the application, just really what needs to be done. So Yeah, me not having to second guess any step of the process really just streamlined it. And, you know, we finished our session and 24 hours later, I had all of my materials put in, submitted and really, really clean. And that was with a full night's sleep. I didn't lose sleep over it, literally, because of this, because I knew that the structure was going to be there. I had the information and I knew how to do it. So, yeah, learning that it really becomes very easy to do within reason. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And once once you have that that informed guidance. Right. Yeah. Right. So final question. What advice would you give your younger self? I think the biggest thing is, is to ask for help. Mm-hmm. I think knowing that the information is out there. And especially now, there's so much information all of the time. If you can find a person that knows the process, the ins and outs, then you're going to be in the right place. So that could pertain to anything, like even my singing. I wish I had known the voice teacher or at least the technique that I learned now. I wish I knew it 10 years ago or 15 years ago. But knowing that the questions or the unsure unsuredness that you're feeling can be answered yes. and it can really be streamlined and it almost inevitably turns out that the process is going to be way simpler than you ever expected it oh i'm so happy to hear that i'm so so happy to hear that okay. well thank you so much for joining me today again if anyone's interested let us know that name of your school again PPNJ music studio And where can they find you? You can find us at pbandjmusicstudio.com. P-B-A-N-D-J, right? Yes. Okay. P-B-A-N-D-J musicstudio.com for all of your singing needs. Amazing. 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 Thank you so much for joining us here today. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at Apply Yourself Global and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode leave this episode a review and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.